Hello, everyone. How are you? New platform. We're excited to see everyone. We've got our special guest joining us. I'm Jesse Manning from Business Lunch and the New York Pro Scouts Association. We've been doing live conversations almost every week or more than a year now um, with all kinds of exciting guests. And today is a very special treat as we have Gene Fruth and Jeff Idelson as our special guests. Hello to both of you. How are you? Good. Hello, Jesse. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Um, it's such a privilege to spend a little bit of time with both of you today. Brand new season is just underway and hope still springs eternal for everybody. So that's good. Get them before anyone's too sad. Um, I want to give you both a quick introduction as well as grassroots baseball, and then we can just hop into it if that's all right with you. Sure. Sounds great. So, Gene, you are a traveling uh, photographer for La Vida Baseball. You spent several years working for the National Baseball Hall of Fame, helping to build their archives. You are one of 45 Sony artisans of imagery worldwide, which is so cool. Um, you've been the photographer for the San Francisco Giants, the 49ers, the Oakland Athletics. You were a portrait and wedding photographer before that, uh, before you expanded into shooting high school sports, your son's little league, and ultimately making your way to the pros, like I said. You discovered the magic of photography in your high school darkroom, which speaks to my heart, because for me, it was in Coney Island in a middle school darkroom, but nonetheless. Um, and we'll get to grassroots in a minute. Jeff, you were the president of the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum, where you worked for over 11 years. I think you worked there uh, in total for over 25 years, which is a very, very, very cool thing. You worked in media relations for the New York Yankees uh, as the senior press officer for the 1994 Soccer World Cup Organizing Committee. That's pretty cool. Um, for the Boston Radio Sox Radio Network as a producer for games. And you started your career as a kid working as an ice cream vendor at Fenway Park, um, where you used to occasionally trade ice cream for baseballs with Red Sox players. <laughs> you graduated from Connecticut College and you almost immediately jumped into baseball and you've been in the game in some capacity with brief exception ever since. And lastly, together, you formed Grassroots Baseball in the spring of 2019. Grassroots Baseball is a nonprofit, 501c3, whose mission is to promote and celebrate the amateur game around the globe with a focus on growing interest and participation at the youngest levels. The overarching goal is to give back by providing inspiration, instruction, and equipment to help ensure more children can learn, play, and enjoy the game. I do that for all my guests, and I say, Gene and Jeff, that is all the things people can find out about you on the internet. So tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, tell us about the organization and what you're doing with Grassroots Baseball. And I'll, to make it easier, Gene, why don't you go first? Okay, I um, love the introduction. Uh, ex wedding photography, wherever you found that on the internet. Hmm. <laughs> it was a one and done. I, I was an assistant, well, for maybe two or three weddings. But uh, portrait photography, absolutely. Um, uh, so uh, for me, grassroots baseball, I kind of lost everybody. I don't see you guys. No, you're, we're just focusing on your video. You're talking, so we figure we give you the spotlight. <laughs> oh. Okay. Okay. I keep it just like that. That like that works. Great. Okay. All right. So I'll let, I'll let Jeff go first. Go ahead, Jeff. You you start. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the uh, working in baseball has always been a passion of mine, and uh, you know, I, I've been at the major league level in the Hall of Fame, but uh, the grassroots game, which is uh, something that uh, has been near and dear to Jean's heart for a very long time. Uh, was something that I noticed uh, as she was working for the Hall of Fame was her passion for the grassroots game and how that made me feel. And uh, uh, from that, we formed, uh, you know, grassroots baseball at, at, at her suggestion and uh, out of the and it came out of her first book, Grassroots Baseball, where we begin. And the two years that we've been involved in it, aside from COVID, have been have just been tremendous. Um, the stories and the um, give back programs we've put together have been meaningful, uh, not only to those with whom we're working, but to us as well. Um, thank you for sharing that. A little bit of insight into how it got started. Gene, we don't, we don't have to go back to intros if you don't want, you did great. <laughs> um, so let's just jump into some things here. It's always nice to start with what you're currently working on. Um, funny enough for us, actually, Billy Blitzer, who helps run the Scouts organization, a longtime Cub Scout, Son Jamie Moyer, Sean Dunstan was back at his first baseball game since 2019. Uh, and that applies similarly sort of to both of you. So after a long hiatus 
from the book and the shooting for the next book, you just had the opportunity to get back out and uh, shoot some more for Grassroots Baseball Route 66. So let's start with your recent trips on the road. Uh, as you were able to get back at it with youth groups and legends of the game, an iconic part of our country, what were some of the emotions given everything we've been through as people in the last year? Jeff, do we, uh, do you want to start? Yeah, no, I, I think the, you know, the emotions have been, have been strong. I think people, what we're finding is that people really have missed baseball. They've missed interactivity and, um, you know, the pockets of it that we found during COVID here and there, um, you know, we're a little bit of a sign of hope. And now that things are, markedly getting better in our country and we have a ways to go you know seeing kids back to playing little league seeing the images posted on the internet where we aren't and uh, just knowing what that means the connectivity the ability to be outside playing the ability to play with your friends the ability to learn and grow uh the emotions are high for people and it's exciting to be back out there i think um and gene you actually sent over some photos that you've been taking that'll be in the new book we would love to share those and maybe you can just talk a little bit about what you've been doing over the last month or so um katie you can throw them up and yeah gene talk about the trip a little bit and if you see something tell us about it. <laughs> sure um so uh, i don't see the images in front of me but i will say that we spent time oh there oh so there's the very end of uh route 66 um, as you know, Route 66 starts in Chicago, downtown Chicago, ends in Santa Monica. And we've traversed Route 66 now several times. Our first journey was before COVID, you know, in our RV, traveling from Chicago to Santa Monica. And Jesse, just a side note, Jeff drove the RV the entire way. I never got behind the wheel. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's a Hercules. It was a request of Jeff's after a while. Like, he didn't want me to drive. Not because of driving ability. I think it was he was wearing it as a badge of honor, and he drove every single mile. So it was, uh, it was an exciting journey. And when we started out... Um, the, the goal and was to um, just really highlight and promote the game in, in town, small towns, Route 66 in some ways is kind of the forgotten small towns. But, you know, just if you, you know, travel and take the time to go to these places, you'll see baseball is thriving and there are very athletic kids of all ages, um, you know, thriving and wanting to play baseball and having the opportunity to play is what we're trying to do as grassroots baseball. And we did clinics along the way and we had such great uh, hall of famers and legends that grew up or had close ties to that area that we were doing the, the clinics and all along the way that joined us and were so generous with their time and their knowledge and played, you know, catch and did the clinic with the kids, words of inspiration. And then of course we had these wonderful sponsors that allowed us to give uh, a new Rawlings glove and baseball to each kid. And it was just what it was such a great way to start grassroots baseball. It's really what we both envisioned when we said we want to do something and give back what we want to give back in a way in something that we love. And of course, baseball is a love for both of us and always has been and for for a long time for me and probably always has been for Jeff. Um, and uh, it just couldn't have started off better. Um, Oh, there's home of uh, Billy. Oh, you go ahead and tell the story, Jeff. Oh, this is great. So uh, Billy Hatcher uh, is one of the Route 66 legends who uh, was kind enough to be in one of our, to have one of our clinics, Jesse. And he grew up in uh, Williams, Arizona, which is up along Route 40, just a little bit west of Flagstaff and uh, Winslow, made uh, Winslow, Arizona, made, you know, popular through song. But uh you know, as Billy was, we were there, he was telling us about this place, Rod Steakhouse, which this small, tiny town, this is like the place you went if you were going to have a steak. And there was a big uh, porcelain bowl that's outside the steakhouse. And Billy tells the story of having some mammoth game in high school. I can't remember the complete details. I don't know if you do, Gene, but some huge game in high school. And he's having breakfast at the diner the next morning. And his buddies had rolled this porcelain cow all the way down to the diner to say that he was the bull. He was the lead dog. And it was just a good memory of that steak. Out. That's <laughs> the awesome. bull is now chained to the restaurant. So <laughs> after that, I got wise to not having the bull be able to be rolled around the town anymore. So I think it was a one and done. And Billy and his buddies were the last uh, kids who got a chance to do that. 
That's but it sounds point. like this, and, and, and going back, and Billy's a, a legend in that town. I mean, we went to his high school, and it was such a, you know, the kids were so excited, you know, to see him, knew his story, and what inspiration to say, hey, I can do that too. If he can do it, look, he's, you know, from this same small town. And um, it, it just gives kids hope, inspiration, and why can't they? And, you know, why can't they be the next Billy Hatcher from their town? I think that's terrific. Another perfect example is the image you have on the screen now. That's Binger, Oklahoma, and that's their Little League field. Um, and the vats you see in the back is uh, peanuts. They store it's a it's a town that um, harvested peanuts. And um, I think and so of course town of Johnny Bench, um, who was kind enough. Uh, he's participating in this book. He was just so terrific at the clinics with the kids. Um, and I'll let Jeff, you know, join in a little bit more on this one. But Binger, Oklahoma, a town of 640 people today, and that's what it was when Johnny was growing up. And um, got a chance to spend some time there several times. And just recently, Jeff and I uh, were in Binger um, and photographed one of their high school games. And they play teams all along Route 66. And uh, Johnny's memories um, of those days, and then meeting the kids today, and uh, and you know, and seeing the town and what they're up against in these small towns and the challenges that they have, you know, and in a lot of places, you know, that's, there's, you know, poverty and, and um, lack of opportunity and lack of jobs. So they're facing real life, you know, problems and adversity um, to overcome. So being there for them and uh, participating and telling their stories as best we can, um, it feels really good to start grasping baseball along with 66 because of stories like that and long story. Were you in a helicopter for that one? The yeah, I was actually, that caused quite a ruckus, that helicopter. Um, uh, when you fly over Binger in a helicopter, you 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 definitely attract some attention. So much so that actually Johnny Bench called me while I was in the helicopter and he said, are you in a helicopter over Binger? And I said, oh my gosh, I am. And he's like, well, the whole town knows and looking up and what do you do? I go, well, I just thought it'd be interesting to see it. You know, that would be a great view. And it was just terrific. I, actually, what I thought it was going to be was completely different than what it looked like. And it was it was great to tell the story and for me to see it that way. So, but yeah, today I am still known. We were just back there and somebody brought up the helicopter. I'm always going to be the lady in the helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> That's hysterical. Um, let me see. Are there any other ones should we do the beginning one from the route just quickly and we'll show that or the Mickey Mantle one? Any of those two you want to talk about? We can show those. Oh, we can show Mickey Mantle. All right. Let's show the Mickey Mantle statue and talk about that. I know you just posted that, I think, on Facebook a couple of days ago or on Instagram. Yeah, um, just, you know, going back, that was my first time. And I didn't get to get to go to Commerce um, because of my travel schedule when we were doing Route 66. And I also was shooting the major league game. So I was traveling back and forth. And it, you know, that, that was, this project takes time because, well, at the time also Jeff was still um, president of the Hall of Fame. So he had a little job too that he was handling <laughs> at the same time. So uh, this was my first trip to Commerce, Oklahoma, though not my last. I have another one scheduled now. Um, and it was just, I didn't expect to get the feeling that I got, and and Jeff had been there, so he knew. He said, "Oh yeah, like to to be where Mickey Mantle grew up, and his house is still there. We're planning on doing a shoot there, and um, seeing the high school where he played, and then this tribute to him, this beautiful statue in in the outfield, and uh, that was a big one for me. That definitely brought chills and driving around in such a small town where he's he you know mickey mickey mantle street and mickey mantle everything and um he is the town i guess i'll let you i i know it brought memories for you back because you had a chance to work with mickey a bit yeah no it really did gene and uh, jesse and I, I did touch bit touch with mantle a little bit during my time at the yankees it was towards the end of his career when i was there in the late 80s and early 90s and unfortunately passed away just a, just a little bit into my tenure with the hall of fame but you know he had always talked about commerce kind of with a smile and uh you know once you go there and realize you know this is a lead and zinc town uh lead and zinc mining town and there's nothing left of that now and it's just a small desolate area and then you realize that commerce which is in the northeast 
corner of Oklahoma, Jesse, and abuts Kansas, a Baxter Springs, Kansas, and just over the line from Kansas by 13 miles is Joplin, Missouri. And you get where Mickey Mantle grew up and went to high school to where he played uh, semi-pro ball with a bunch of minors in uh, in Baxter Springs and was signed by Tom Great, uh, Greenway, the great scout who signed him for the Yankees, who also signed Bobby Mercer and Elston Howard. And then you look to Joplin, Missouri, where he played minor league baseball. And here you have three different places on Route 66 where Mickey Mantle had an impact. And uh, just as Gene said, the, the, the spirituality of being in commerce was unlike anything I've had. I've, I've been to a lot of hometowns of Hall of Famers, but there was something special about being in commerce. And John Taminia, um, the scout for the White Sox for many, many years, he actually has that picture of Tom Greenway and Mickey Mantle on his wall, and he sent it in to me last year to post. But yes, that is the iconic thing and, and unbelievable and such a, a, a cool place, the crossing of three states and created a legend. So it's kind of at the crux of everything you guys do, right? <laughs> yeah. The Little League Field is also named after his dad as well, which was which was wow. fun. We didn't. Well, uh, we're going to shoot a game there when we get back. There was there wasn't a game going on there, but it was great to see Mutt Mantle's name uh, behind the uh, uh, home plate. And, um, I'm excited to go back there and document a game. And uh, I see right here. This is the beginning of Route 66 in Chicago, right? Yes, and you should have seen Jeff driving the RV there. That was quite. <laughs> We have a photo. I think there's a photo of the two of you with the RV that we can, whether it's now or in a little bit. You're not, in, as I kept saying to myself, you're not in Cooperstown anymore. <laughs> Imagine this is the first time he's driving an RV and we have to start in a pretty, you know, in downtown Chicago. So those turns were tight. There you go. But Jeff, Jeff rocked it. That's, yeah. that's the two of you with the RV. There you go. <laughs> yeah, that's that's Pontiac, Illinois, which is about, I don't know, 90 miles south of Chicago on Route 66. But, you know, there's nothing quite after driving a Honda CRV, which is about six feet long to stepping behind the, the wheel of this 24 foot behemoth and trying to you know navigate Lakeshore drive turns. I'm like, what have I signed up for? <laughs> Well, you did it, and you're both alive, so that's, yeah, that's yeah. all that matters, right? <laughs> um, so I know you've uh, both gotten to know a lot of Hall of Famers over the year and just people in the game over the years. Jeff, uh, you're like family to so many of them, uh, members of the Hall of Fame. I know Tom Seaver gave you priceless advice when you first were coming to the Hall of Fame um, all those years ago that you carried along with your beautiful friendship. You delivered Whitey Ford's eulogy this past year. Um, you're in close touch with Hank Aaron and Phil Necro. And Gene, I know that you've also, especially in the recent years, gotten to know some of these Hall of Famers just so personally. Um, and one of the reasons when we were first talking about this, I mentioned to Sean Clancy, you know, I'd love to talk to somebody who really did have that uh, relationship with a lot of these people who passed in the last year, because this is sort of unprecedented. A lot of people that have made a huge impact, and both of you know them personally, and you had those relationships. So if you wouldn't mind, let's talk a little bit about just the people that we've lost, the impact that they had on the game, but also in general, and any any fond memories that you want to share with people. Um, Gene, it's easier, I feel like, if I pick someone to start with. So Gene, why don't we start with you? If yeah, I mean, of course, my relationship pale in comparison to Jeff's. I mean, the relationships that he forged over those 25 years at the Hall of Fame and the friendships that he had and the sadness that he had this year uh, is tremendous, you know? So, I mean, my relationship with the Hall of Famers, of course, is, you know, as a photographer, what we're trying to do is tell the stories and we want the viewer to get the story. And so learning their stories, hearing their stories and being able to hopefully have pictures to show that tell the stories is, you know, what I'm interested in and getting to know them in that way, um, you know, I'm very grateful for and, um, and any stories that they shared with me, um, you know, Hank Aaron, my, the story, you know, him participating in grassroots baseball in my book. I mean, just that in itself was such a, a big wow. And that really had a lot to do with the friendship that Jeff had uh, that with, with Hank, you know, and the phone calls that they had each week and um, 
but when uh, when the book came out and he looked through the Mobile uh, chapter, um, and I've told this story before because it's it's one of you know you will say what is what one of the greatest moments of what you did? Well, it was when Hank Aaron looked through the Mobile chapter and he said, "Wow, this is really Mobile," and I thought, "Well, that does it for me." And that's the <laughs> compliment you're always trying to show your sense of place and tell your stories and so it felt great and I felt proud that I was able to represent you know Hank and his childhood home and in, uh, in the right way and and so the stories along the way of, of those Hall of Famers who passed Tom Kieber I had the opportunity to photograph him at his home which of course is intimate in his vineyard and what he loved his second career and and just having that opportunity and the stories and because being an artist, he was very proud of his art and art was really important to him. So I was able to get a tour of his art and see an Angie Warhol painting of himself on his wall. And I think, wow, you know, that you know, blew me away. I could have just <laughs> stared at that. I was, I got so taken with it. I didn't even get a, the right image of him in front of it. And I still to this day go, oh my gosh, I was just so taken with that he had an Andrew Warhol of himself in his house. So it was just, yeah. And I mean, his art was incredible. He was so proud of it. And uh, and just, and the moments like that and, and Whitey Ford and being able to, for him to tell his story of New York, my hometown and talk about Queens and talk about Yankee Stadium and those early days, you know, and I had a chance to take Whitey's portrait a few times as well as uh, him and his wife, Joan and, um, and yeah, and getting to know those families, not in the way, like I said, the Jeff, but uh, I'm forever grateful for all, all of those moments and memories. And that's what it is. It's the journey and the memories. So I'll let you take it, Jeff, because you have a lot more to say. Yeah, we could fill a book with Jeff. So yeah, just tell, us, yeah. tell us what comes to mind. And I'm sure there's plenty of good stuff. Yeah, Jesse, I mean, just, you know, cir cir circling back to what Gene said about the book, I think what's important to realize is when we were laying laying the book out and who might be the um, essay writer for the introductory chapters. We, there were 13 Hall of Famers, 16 legends overall, three non-Hall of Famers in the book. And I said to Gene, we've got to come up with three in each of these 13, of these 13 categories. We've got to come up with three each because they're not all going to say yes. And when, you know, when we explained the project to them, what it was about and the realization that Gene was the photographer and the realization they knew her from Hall of Fame weekend, we went 13 for 13, so um, <laughs> testament to Jean's work and uh, her connection and relationship with the Hall of Famers as well. Um, yeah, long time with these guys, Tom Seaver, Jim Rice, Wade Boggs, I've known 35 years. I met them, you know, when I walked in the door of uh, the clubhouse at Fenway Park in 1986. Well, not Tom Seaver, because we got him at the trade deadline for Steve Lyons in one of the most lopsided trades in the history of trades. And he won four games in August down the stretch for us before he got hurt. But uh, the relationships are significant. And when you spend that much time with people, they're only going to naturally develop. But, you know, Phil Necro, I often joked, uh, you know, he spent as much time in Cooperstown as I did. And in fact, one uh, New Year's Eve, I'm out shoveling my driveway and I get a tap on the shoulder and turn around and it's, it's the guy says, hey, do you have a shovel? And it's Phil. And I'm like, what are you doing here? He's like, I came in for a fundraiser, decided not to tell you. And I said, if you're not careful, you're going to have to start paying taxes here. But uh, <laughs> Phil, Phil, was near, he, he, Phil was such a near and dear uh, friend to me personally and the Hall of Fame. I mean, he just... Uh, he bled Hall of Fame through and through, as most of these guys do. Whitey Ford, I had known, of course, from my Yankee days and old timers days when he and Mickey and DiMaggio and all the guys would come in and, you know, Whitey would come to spring training and forged a really nice relationship. And I've known his family for many, many years. He and Phil Rizzuto, both, I was very close with. Um, and I was sorry to see the scooter pass. Uh, Joe Morgan is the vice chairman of the Hall of Fame. I probably talked to twice a month just about Hall of Fame issues, one of the most introspective players I've ever worked with, a guy that uh, maybe had a bit of a gruff exterior. I know he rubbed people the wrong way, but uh, at the end of the day, he loved the game and he really thought about it very thoughtfully. He put a lot of, he cared about the way things worked out. And uh, the way I sum it up, Jesse, is we had 10 Hall of Famers die in an 11 month span, which is just absolutely devastating. And for the folks in heaven, I think they owe Cooperstown a bit of, a bit of gratitude because they've inherited a five-man rotation that includes 300, three 300-game three, three winners and, oh, by the way, Bob Gibson and Whitey Ford. 
a three-person outfield of Al Kaline, Lou Brock, and Hank Aaron all with more than 3,000 hits, a two-time MVP at second base, and oh, by the way, here's Tommy Lasorda to come manage you. So I think we dealt them a pretty good hand at our expense, but I know speaking for baseball fans everywhere, the opportunity to have got these – to have gotten to see these guys play and, and to get to know them a little bit makes us all the more richer. Thank you both for sharing that. Um, that's beautiful. And kind of leads into the next thing here. For me, it seems sort of fitting that you're stewards of the game in the way that you are. You've both worked your way up, Jeff. We said ice cream vendor at Red Sox games and then moving on to the Red Sox right after college. You paid your dues, obviously working up in Jean. Uh, growing your craft at the Little League level, right? And, and taking pictures of your son's games before you moved to California and ended up working your way up to that pro level and now what you're doing. So let's just talk about that. People, one of the things I like to do is talk about how to make the game more accessible for the youth, which is exactly what you're doing because sometimes it seems so closed off. So can you talk about for yourselves what is it that you kept with you? What advice can you give, not only to get there, but to stay there for as long as you have? And uh, Jeff, why don't we start with you on this one? You mean you mean advice for having a career in baseball? Exactly right. Yes. I, you know, I, I was I was fortunate to to have some mentors early on, beginning with my parents, who uh, you know really stressed the um, stressed the notion of, of finding what you love and trying to make it work and. You know, it, uh, it it didn't come easy working in baseball. I did start as a vendor, and I I did have uh, you know an op, a, a time when uh, I wasn't able to get a job in, in baseball and was really sorting out in my own mind what I wanted to do. And you know, I had the opportunity to do other business ventures, and you know, it just kept coming back to my mom saying, you know, you've worked so hard to try to work in baseball. Why don't you just try it a little longer? You can always do something else. And thankfully, I did. And so for you know, those starting out, uh, no matter what it is, and it's it's a message that Gene and I have heard the Hall of Famers that came to our clinics and part on the kids, follow your dreams and passion, whatever it is that you like, and try to make a go at it. Because if you can, you'll never feel like you worked a day in your life. Gene, what about you? What uh, What's some advice that you have? It could probably be that same advice that Jeff just said. but Well, yeah, I mean, there's a practical advice, though, that I... Um... If, I mean, you talk about me shooting the uh, Little League and I have just as much joy and I say this and I say it wholeheartedly, shooting a Little League game, shooting a youth game, shooting Miracle League like we did in Oklahoma uh, a week ago. It doesn't really, it's not the who, but it's the what. And I know we talk about these big names and we talk about Hall of Famers and sure, that's really special. But if I'm giving advice to a photographer, another photographer, or if I'm giving advice to someone who just wants to be in baseball on any level, if they want to be in PR, if they want to be a scout, if they want to be whatever they want to be, my advice would really be the same as to start at the lower level where you can learn and have the access to hone your skills. And then I really think it can come. So if you can get that job, and I, and I see it all the time when I shoot college games, the photographer, the college photographer kid will always come over to me, a young adult will always come over to me and chat with me, you know? And it's great when we have that chat and I immediately know they're on Instagram. So I get my phone and say, let me follow you. And it's fun to follow them and see what they're doing. And there's so, so much talent out there. So I'd say, don't worry about the who, if you're so worried about you know, uh, I need to be on a major league field. You know, it's kind of like, are you trying to be a rock star? Or are you trying to be great at your craft? So we don't get to just go on stage with Bruce Springsteen and play our guitar. We got to practice our guitar first before we can become, right, uh, Bruce Springsteen. Sorry for the 80s reference. <laughs> no, um, Bruce Springsteen's a uh, <laughs> But We're talking it, with the New York Pro Scouts Association. Oh, that's right. That's right. Coney Island. Let's go. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, yeah, for me, I think I go to the high school field, go to the Little League field, go to the college field and, and get the jobs there. Take the pictures for free if you have to and, you know, become as good as you can become and study those that came before you. So if you want to be a scout, who were the great scouts and how did they do it? If you want to be a broadcaster, well, who were the great ones and study it? And if you want to be a photographer, buy Neil Lifer's baseball book and study him. That's my advice. So 
I think I think you're both a very good barometer for where the game is currently at on the youth level. That's something we as an organization are very passionate about, especially here in New York City as well. Gene, through your viewfinder, I mean, you're you're photographing youth level baseball all the time. Um, Jeff, for 25 years, you were stewarding the next generation of kids into Cooperstown. For me and a lot of the conversations I've had, and for fans too, they hear all the time about the concern of baseball for the youth and the kids aren't as interested in the game anymore. Where do you guys feel the game is at on the youth level as a whole? Um, Gene, I'll start with you on this one. Yeah, I, I mean, certainly kids are interested in baseball. I mean, when we're out there and we see them out there playing and, you know, now as we come out of COVID carefully and we see kids getting back on the field and the smiles on their faces. Um, but you compete with a lot, you know, baseball uh, moves a little slower than other sports. And now just all youth sports are competing in video games and there's a lot of distractions and, and attention spans are different than they used to be better or worse. I don't know, but it, it's the reality of what it is. So being able to adjust. And I think major league baseball is trying to figure that out and, present the best game that it can present. I, I'd like to, I, I just, I hope for, that the minor leagues and the independent leagues find a, a strong voice. I know they've gone through a lot with missing their seasons completely with COVID, with changes in the major league game. And I worry about that with youth sports because I think that's a place where you can find fun for youths. It's, a lot less expensive to go to a minor league game or an independent game than it is for a family of four to go to Yankee Stadium and, you know, just in, to buy, you know, hot dogs and, and soft drinks and four tickets, you know, is is a lot. So but going to the minor league game and you can get a hot dog for a dollar sometimes and it's all this and they know how to make it fun and entertaining for families, for kids. And, I th and, and they get to see the stars of tomorrow. At least that's the way it's supposed to be or used to be. And I just hope that we somehow get to that or get back to that. And I know minor leagues haven't started yet. I think they start May 1st, maybe. And I don't know what, if all of them are going to be starting and what happens to independent leagues. I haven't kept up completely with all the changes, but I, I do think that's key in keeping our youth interested is that families need to bring the kids to see tomorrow's stars at these, at these parks. It's so exciting. I and mean, think of it, we got to see Francisco Lindor before he became a star and you can say, well, I saw him in, uh, you know, Illinois somewhere or, you know, at the sod poodles, like how cool. <laughs> Is that you know why he was a sod poodle before he was a you know whoever their stars were and I I, I think that's a, a key component to keeping baseball interesting at the youth level. Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, I echo a lot of what Gene is saying, and we saw that along Route 66, where you know you go into these small towns and uh, that have minor league teams and uh, independent teams, or they're close to minor league teams, and there's great uh, joy in who they saw come up through. The ranks and you know to echoing gene sentiments you know that, that, that i i hope there hasn't been so much of an attrition that we lose a lot of baseball fans and the same with the draft you know you worry about uh how many fewer rounds there are now than there once were the other piece is the is the uh you know the the divide between the haves and the have-nots with american legion ball rapidly disappearing and travel ball quickly uh accelerating and you know a lot of what we're doing with grassroots baseball is trying to give kids an opportunity at the very youngest level to be introduced to the game so at least they can find out if they like it. And you just hope that as they progress, uh, those that like the game progress through the youth levels and get to be 11, 12, 13, that uh, there's a mechanism for them to continue because um, it's uh, team sports, as we all know, teaches many valuable lessons beyond the playing field uh, that help us in life. They help us with health. They help us in so many ways. And uh, you hate to see that get fractured as a result of economics. Uh, that were the reason. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, you just hope that there can be more of a, a concentration where uh, things slow down a little bit and uh, there's an acceptance and appreciation for baseball as it is. And with MLB continuing to try to finesse the game to make it uh, a bit more exciting. So uh, I want to talk the book 
the first book is right behind me and we have the cover uh, that we can share now. You've both traveled all over the world for baseball. Um, Gene, for the first book, you're in Mexico and Curacao, Japan, the Dominican Republic, the US, more than that. Um, for La Vida Baseball, you are all over the world covering the sport. And Jeff, as the president of the Hall of Fame, you made it your duty to meet new inductees and members of the Hall family on their home turf. So you were able to forge those lasting relationships with them that we talked about. So just talk about youth baseball throughout the world and baseball throughout the world a little bit. How does it vary? What excites you the most about what you've seen at the grassroots level? Um, I'll start with you, Jeff, on this one. Well, Jean can really speak to the grassroots level because she's done so much of it around the globe. But for me on the major league level and, you know, uh, visiting with Hall of Famers, um, you know, the, the, the reverence that these guys have still in the communities in which they grew up is, is massive. And, you know, you go to the Dominican Republic and you're with Juan Marichal, who's, you know, 80 something years old and he's not forgotten. So the uh, lasting impact he had as a player and what it represents for a country is really, really significant and doesn't die down. As the, and as the Hall of Fame continues to uh, become more diverse, you know, now with Vladdy, uh, you know, Vladdy going in as the first position player uh, and Pedro as well and um, uh, other countries starting to, you know, eventually see their first Hall of Famers. Um, I think that uh, you know, the, the game is going to just grow significantly. The appreciation for the game in, in countries outside of the U.S. will be appreciated more within the U.S. And Gene, grassroots baseball around the world, what's, what, what do you see? <laughs> Well, for me, um, documenting the game, uh, my job is to tell the stories and baseball looks different in different places. It's played the same, right? Same number of players, a bat and a ball, and the rules are pretty much the same. Though I do like that in a lot of the Latin American countries, or all of them, there's no shift. I'm not a <laughs> bad shift. I love that there's no shift. But uh, so it's it's, it's telling those stories and it's showing those cultural differences. And that's my job as a photographer is to show the viewer that baseball looks different. Topography, geography, cathedrals versus sand lots and what that looks like and what the kids look like and how they're playing, how they celebrate. What are their fans looking like? What are those backgrounds um, looking like? And you know, what are the conditions of the fields that they're playing on? You know, are they, you know, most of the time they're very simple, very modest, and you know they come from you know very little means, but yet they're playing the game with an incredible passion. Being able to show that passion and how they play the game and how you know when they start the game. You know, Dominican Republic on a Saturday there's not a field that's not you know being used unless it's torrential downpour, and you can go anywhere and you're going to see you know, this massive, and sometimes it's just absolute chaos, but they're playing baseball. And uh, it's, that's my job is to show that. And that's the excitement for me. Every time I go to a new place and it's going to be, what, 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 what am I going to see? And it's, I'm going to see something different. And then it's figuring out how do I tell that story and document it so I can show the world what it looks like and, and take them there with me. So um, that's very exciting in places like Japan. You know, there's so, so much incredible cultural differences. The way the, the kids practice, how they run in order, their right knee goes up and their left knee goes up. The entire team does it. I don't know how they have to get them to do that. I was a little league coach once. So I <laughs> any kind of control like that. Um, and just, and then the, the respect that kids in Japan have for their equipment and for the umpires, how they start and end the game by bowing to the umpire. And um, it's just, uh, it's these, these are the pleasures uh, that I am so grateful to have as I travel and tell the story. And, and that's, that's what my job is. You know, I actually, um, for a documentary that we're making was down in Florida and got to see JR East, which is like one of the industrial league teams in Japan doing spring training. Uh, and it was just, it was unbelievable. So for anyone, a baseball fan, and I think we're talking to a lot of baseball fans, that is definitely something to see just the game around the world and, and how it's different and how it's the same. So thank you both for, uh, for sharing those stories. So let's, I'm going to do a question for Gene, a question for Jeff. So Gene, on Twitter, your pinned tweet uh, is a photo that you took of Jackie Robinson's statue outside of Dodger Stadium with a Jackie Robinson quote that is 
a life is not important except in the impact it has on other lives. Um, and in an interview you recently did with B&H, as you were getting ready for your Route 66 road trip, I think, uh, you mentioned if you could photograph anyone, that it would be Jackie sliding into home plate with Yogi Berra at the plate, trying to defend the plate. Talk about why Jackie Robinson is such an important figure for you personally. We all know why he's so important in the game, but for you personally, um, and how you try to impact other lives through yours. Well, sure. I mean, did that Jackie Robinson statue uh, at Dodger Stadium is beautiful. I spent a lot of time looking at it from every angle, from early in the morning to late at night to shoot it um, and to tell the statues are tricky. Um, uh, so, and you want to um, you want to tell the story, and um, uh, I love that statue. Actually, it's it's really beautiful the way they have him sliding in. So, sure, I mean, of all the figures in baseball history and in much American history, no one stands taller than Jackie Robinson, right? Wow, I mean, his integration of the modern game um, in the 1940s, you know, it paved the way towards equality in baseball. And I mean, and to me. It's, it's what, you know, grassroots baseball wants to do. Uh, you know, of course, we're two people and we're certainly not Jackie Robinson, but uh, he paved the way for equality. And if we can, uh, as a small grassroots baseball and we're growing and we're hopeful for our future, and that's what we want to do is help pave the way for equality. For so kids who are not able to play the game because they don't have a glove or they don't have the opportunity or they've never been introduced to it. If we can do that and have an impact, like that famous quote of life is not important except for the impact it has on other lives. Isn't that so true, right? What inspiration. So certainly that has inspiration for Jeff and I, inspiration for grassroots baseball, inspiration for me personally, and you know, wanting to to do that in our small way, uh, like Jackie Robinson did for so many, you know, that are playing the game right now. And I'm sure one or maybe both of you have had the chance, I would think, to meet his wife, who's 98 years old, amazing, <laughs> or his daughter. Yeah, Rachel I photographed. Jackson. Yeah, I photographed Rachel Robinson um, with Vera Clemente uh, on the veranda at the Otisaga in Cooperstown, and what a moment that was. These two women who were, you know, stewards of the game and and um, representing their husbands and, and continuing the mission of both of their husbands, you know, Rachel right up until this day and Vera right up until the day she died. So, uh, and Rachel was there, uh, Rachel Robinson was uh, at Cooperstown. What was the occasion she was receiving the award, uh, Jeff? That the Buck O'Neill Award, I think, right? Uh, yeah, right. Um, so yeah, that was, that was a really special weekend. So also having her at the podium, but the moment for me, uh, was on the, the back veranda with, with the two women and watching their connection as I was photographing them. And then also Claire Smith, um, also was there and I got an opportunity to document Claire with, with Rachel Robinson and, um, another woman that I respect so much in the game. So that was a big day. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was a Gene question, but Jeff, anything you want to throw in on, on Jackie or uh, Vera or Rachel or Claire Smith? I mean, all wonderful people in the game. Yeah, no, Gene spoke so eloquently. The only thing I would say is that with Jackie Robinson, um, the one anecdote I can, I can share is that when he was uh, being considered for the Hall of Fame for election in 1962, it, he, he made it very clear to the sports writers that he had no interest in being elected for integrating the game. If he was going to be elected, it was because of his playing ability. And he was an incredible player, as we know. And, you know, part of the reason, if not all the reason, he was elected. And, you know, there was nothing about his integrating the game on his plaque. And, you know, you fast forward now from the 1960s to the 2000s, 2010s, and then you know, you get visitors wondering, you know, why do, why isn't there anything there? Are you like, trying to hide the fact that he integrated the game? And I mean, of course not, but um, it was what his wishes were. And so we finally decided uh, during uh, uh, when I started as president to take his plaque and, and add something to it about his integrating the game. And uh, uh, out of the closest respect I could have to what his family's wishes were, we put it at the very, very end of the plaque. 
Uh, also used the opportunity to put in his 19 steals of home, which I thought belonged on the plaque as well. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, which would be exactly what Gene wanted to photograph, was him stealing home. So there oh, you go. No doubt. Oh. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but if you ask Yogi, use out, use out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, now on to our Jeff question. Jeff, you've spent your career representing these iconic institutions, the Red Sox, the Yankees, and the Hall of Fame. I imagine with all of the different gifts that came with your role with these organizations, there was a routine and an incredible level of expectation about how things had to be done very specifically. So why did you decide it was time to retire from a place uh, and from a type of role you've done for your whole career for 25 years that's been so formative, I'd imagine, to start something on your own with Gene um, that's giving you the ability to, I think, work in the game kind of fully on your own terms? Very much so, Jesse. And uh, yeah, I just, you know, I've been a long time at the Hall of Fame, 33 years in baseball overall. And, you know, you, you start to look at what you, you know, what, what you've been a part of, what you've been able to do. And I felt very fortunate to have had so, so many great years at the Hall of Fame. But, um, you know, it was starting to think about what might be next. And, you know, when Gene worked for the Hall of Fame, I had the opportunity to cross paths with her a couple times on the road where we collaborated on projects and we'd be worse and take the WBC in Japan, you know, shooting a game and, and working on that. And then the next thing I know she's leaving and I'm asking her, where are you going? She's well, I'm going to a little league game. Where else would I be going? Or if we're in another kind of life, you know, we're in, in the Dominican, you know, I would call her. I'm like, are you, you know, are you here in the hotel? No, I'm, a, I'm across the Island at a game. So I started to see her appreciation for the game and, and then working on the, you know, helping her with the book, uh, Grassroots Baseball, Where Legends Begin, and tying the Hall of Famers together. And, uh, you know, she came up with the idea. She's like, what do you think about taking this book and turning it into, you know, a, a program, a not-for-profit program, and uh, as a way of giving back? And, you know, both of us were at a point in that life where that sounded appealing to me. And um, I said, yeah, well, let me think about it for a minute and uh, give it some thought. And we talked about it some more. And then, asked her, you know, well, how would you want to launch it? And she said, you know, well, how about Route 66? And I said, yeah, like, I think that sounds great. I mean, I'd like to think about it, maybe relax for a little bit and then come back and do this. And she's like, yeah, take all the time you want. And I think it was two days later. She's like, hey, I've got an RV and a few sp sponsors lined up. When can you start? And I'm like, I'm still working for the Hall of Fame. But uh, the passion was there. It was incredibly appealing, the idea of getting back to the grassroots game. And uh, I'm so glad I did because – I loved everything I did in Cooperstown with the Red Sox and Yankees, but being a, being at, at small ballparks, minor league ballparks, sand lots, seeing Gene work, getting to talk to volunteers and coaches and understanding and really getting their passion. And then being able to help stage these clinics and maybe make a difference in some areas has been really, really rewarding. Um, so from our usual format, one of the first questions I ask the guests before we even really get into it is about their relationship with scouts. Um, and if they have one with our organization, Jeff, I know you've been to our dinner a few times over the years, years ago. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Scouts. We're the Scouts organization. One of the things we try to do, as I said, is connect the youth uh, with people from the game and make it a little bit more accessible because it doesn't seem that way all the time. Uh, and Scouts actually feature pretty prominently within the first book. So the title is uh, Grassroots Baseball, Where Legends Begin, right? There you go, where legends begin. And the scouts uh, are a huge part of that. Vlad Guerrero, Fernando Valenzuela, Whitey Ford, and some of the others actually all mention in their essays the scout that signed them, the famous scout that signed them. Talk about the relationships that you've both forged with scouts over the years, the impact that they continue to have throughout baseball. Gene with the book, Jeff, you helped create the Diamond Mine section of the Hall of Fame. And it took a long time for them to get recognition, but you helped create that. So let's also talk about what role do you see scouts playing as the game continues forward? Uh, let's start with you, Jeff. Well, you know, to me, I often equate a scout with being a human resources director. I mean, if, you, if you're a scout, you're going into a high school, you're looking at kids or maybe in, some, in a lot of cases, junior high school, and you're saying that kid is going to be the CEO of my company in seven years, eight years. That's what they're, you know, they, well, that's what they're, banking on is there is the future ability of kids they're seeing today it's a very difficult job to be a scout and to find those 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 diamonds in the rough and without scouts guys like 
you know, Mike Piazza, who went in the thir- you know the thirteen hundredth pick overall. John Smoltz, who was way up there in draft as a draft pick. Um, you know, those guys aren't getting that opportunity, and it's changing. I know with the draft, but the scouts have a, are are invaluable. They 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 are the human resources director. They're also the recruiting firms, if you will, that go out and and, and are trying to recruit. So they they play in an integral part of the game. They're often overlooked. They don't travel with the team. They travel alone. They're always by themselves, yet they've got this undaunting job of shaping a business. And they do it very, many of them do it very, very effectively. And as we say, they know where to eat as well. So that's why people <laughs> like to hang around with them. Um, Gene, what about yourself? What's your experience meeting scouts or just talking to players about the scout that signed them over the years? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, scouts are forever present, you know, wherever. I mean, like you say in the book, um, being uh, at the Cape Cod League um, and scouts are forever present. You know, as a photographer, I'm doing my job, they're doing their job. And, you know, at first when I was out and about, I really didn't know what they were doing. I mean, I didn't really understand that part of the game so much. And then our paths cross so frequently, you know, and you'd see the same guy. And and in, in some ways it's, um, it's very similar as a photographer. I mean, these guys, who are at the level of you know scouting the Cape Cod League? I was um, for the book. I was also in Tampa shooting. Um, uh, what is the name of the tournament, Jeff? That Wade Boggs. Yeah, yeah the Tony Saladino. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tony. Uh, Tony Saladino tournament. I would and uh, at this high school tournament, there was probably at one of the games, you know, maybe 25 scouts and Tony Saladino feeds all those scouts at, at his tournament. You know, he takes care of those scouts. He knows how important they are. He knows how hard they work. And you just see the travel that they do and how hard they work, you know, to find that right guy. And, and, um, and they're journeymen, really. And I'm, I was in the Dominican Republic so many times. And of course, we all end up at the same hotel. And we all end up at the same hotel bar, really, because like at the end of the night, I'm back and I'm exhausted. And the only place I'm meeting is at the bar. I'm not going anywhere else. I got to download images and I've got to maybe get up for a sunrise. So, and sure enough, you know, when I go in there to eat, I mean, I can see the scouts a mile away. Like I know who like they are. I'm like, oh, there's that guy. There's, you know, and they're always around, you know, and they're always, I love how hard, you know, that they work and seeing them everywhere and the travel that they have to do. And, you know, so our conversations are a lot of where are you going next? And I'll have a lot of, you know, conversations on social media with a lot of them and just staying in touch with them and, you know, knowing I guess I just have an appreciation for how hard their job is and, and what a journey it is. And you can also tell they're, they're lifers, you know, they're just like me, you know, I'm going to be this little old lady and I'm going to be out in the Dominican Republic because it's what I love. So I'm going to just keep doing it until someone says you can't do it anymore. Um, and I just feel like I, I, that's the same way with these scouts. I feel like there's a love of the game and, and they, they like photographers, they're going through, of course, many changes because, you know, what a scout used to do and what a scout is doing now. And I don't at all pretend to know their job, but I do know how analytics has changed so much of the game for them. And, you know, so much of the game has changed for us in many ways uh, as photographers and, and you have to adjust and, and, and figure it out. But uh, nothing brings me more pleasure than seeing them. And, you know, I was in Mexico when I was shooting for the book and there is the famous Mike Brito in his, uh, you know, shirt and that the hat and his cigar and he's with his radar gun and I'm like there he is behind Dodger Stadium and now I was maybe in uh, Obregon or Culiacan I forgot what town I was and you know there he is doing his thing in Mexico and and still doing his job and how cool is it so um, great respect I have and um, watching their journey that's that's awesome um we've just got i think a few minutes left so normally we do rapid fire we do baseball cards today i'm doing the format a little bit different so i think we're going to do show and tell today so (laughs) i brought a couple of items myself to quickly show you and then if there's anything that you both have from your your travel so the first one here a, a one that made me think of eugene so i know you shot the uh cleveland cubs world series the historic World Series. 
This is a ball. I was in the camera well. I was the year before. Kyle Schwarber was in the outfield. There we go. Um, and right in between the innings, about the eighth inning, I was sitting in the camera well during the game, and he missed the cutoff, man, and he threw the ball. It bounced, and it hit me in the head. And I was fine. <laughs> Ridiculous, obviously. Yes, very dangerous in this camera world. But I was fine, and he came in after the inning, and he saw me holding an ice pack on my head, and he's he's like, you want me to sign it for you? You know, like, should I sign the ball for you? And if you're in the media, you're not allowed to do that, but I figured no. he got hit in the head. Why not get the ball signed? That's a memento. So that one made me think of you. Jeff, this dusty videotape uh, is actually from... Who's on first? My friends were doing Who's on First at the Baseball Writers of America dinner in 2011. And that's oh, yeah, I remember time. them. Yeah, I think that's the first time we ever talked. And so that I knew I had it somewhere. So that made me think of you. And the one I'm waiting for, that I these are things I hold dear. I have lots of memorabilia, whatever. I'm sure you do. But these are things that, you know, um, we're making this documentary on Tom Giordano, longtime yeah. scout, T-Bone, signed Cal Ripken Jr., and, you know, Manny Ramirez, all these people. And so we're making this documentary on him and his daughter, Gail, when he passed away just a couple of years back, uh, and he always carried this shillelagh around with him. And she's she's saving it for me for when it's done and we release it. Then I get the shillelagh. So those are things that, I don't know, I thought of you guys. I thought of, of something that means something to me. Do you have anything from your travels um, that you think of to tell us about? <laughs> Well, with the, with the short window, we did come up with one thing we actually found on our last trip, Jesse. It, where were we, Gene? Stroud, Oklahoma, I think? Oh, Stroud, Oklahoma, yes. Yes. Stroud. Tiny little town, Stroud. Uh, it's, it's, it's north of Oklahoma City. And, you know, we're look, walking through the town and looking at different, you know, things that could possibly be in the book. And we come across this, uh, like a consignment store, I guess, or a thrift shop. And, and Jean, she, uh, antiques maybe too yeah yeah so you were you were looking in the window and you see this like oh, yeah. it was a, a baseball you know uh i think there was a maybe a photo of mickey mantle and it was like some sort of a it was all this little it was a little baseball section in the window and oh, i'm always trying to photograph the main streets when i'm there you know it's main street usa so and they all look the same and they all look different. So I was shooting in the window and then we went in and Jeff found this gem. Do you have it? You have it there, Jeff? Oh, <laughs> it is a George Brett nesting doll. Oh my God. Number five. There are four little George Bretts in this. So there's a total of five, like his uniform number. And the great thing about this, in addition to him being one of my favorite human beings and, and gene knows him well too is that he grew up at the very end of route 66 in el segundo california <laughs> he's right back there there he is i thought that was him i was yeah, gonna him. you just had dinner with him i know that's like a yearly thing jeff right you just had dinner with him a couple weeks ago <laughs> yes I, I had dinner connected with gene in oklahoma and there we found little george that's amazing. <laughs> um, and the one other holdover I'm doing from the Instagram live show, we've gotten to asking uh, every single person who's been on the show, our mutual friend, Sean Clancy, he wants to know who is the most famous person in your phone right now. And just a point of reference, we're talking about the book. There's some pretty cool cameos. Paul Simon playing stickball. You got to get the book, the first book and the second book, but you never know what you're going to find. So um, let's start with Eugene. I'm sure there's a million, but who's the most famous person in your phone right now? I'm going to look and see if I've got Sean, because if I have Sean, I'm going to see Sean. <laughs> I hope I have Sean. Probably, Sean probably wouldn't give me his number. <laughs> I don't think I have it. We'll get it to you. I'm sure he'd watch yeah. it. Yeah. Text me, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, oh. You know, for me, uh, it's very different, my relationships compared to Jeff. You know, I don't, my job is to document them and to tell their stories, you know, so sure. I mean, I have the connections with them, but I also, I'd rather have the respectful, you know, my job is to, to tell their stories and not be in the picture with them. It's like, you're like, Oh, we're not supposed to get autographs. Well, you know, so everybody's like, do you want to get a picture with, you know, and no, I really just want to document what's happening and, and tell the stories much more so. So, um, but the 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 
the people that I have in my baseball life that are in my phone, I suppose that, uh, you know, I'm certainly grateful for and, and to be able to now call so many of them friends because of this project. I mean, look what baseball does. I mean, that's really what it is. And our, my camera and, you know, and what you do, it's really just an entree into this life of people that we'd never get to meet, experiences that we'd never get to have, we'd never get to come together. And so to be able to say, you know, I went back to Binger, Oklahoma with Johnny Bench and got to, you know, go to his high school reunion at the community center. I mean, it's just a, a wow experience. So um, that's what it is with that my camera is the entree to this incredible life. So I always want to be respectful of it and grateful for it uh, because it's uh, what an incredible life we're, we're lucky to, you know, to live. Jeff, I don't know how you can answer this question. Maybe the Jose Moda answer of the president of the Dominican Republic is probably better for you. So who's who's the most famous person in your phone? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. The, 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 the only fun story I have of somebody famous, like connecting with my phone as I was at the All-Star game, the famous All-Star game tie, I believe, in Mil Milwaukee, maybe. I don't remember. Maybe it was Milwaukee. I was at an All-Star game with Robin Yount. And Hank Aaron and I was up in their suite and and the, the wide receiver for the Cardinal maybe it was in Arizona Larry Larry Fitzgerald was there and I'm talking to Larry and he's like we should stay connected I'm like well and it was a Blackberry at the time I'm like well let me grab why don't you just tell me he's like give me your phone and he just starts putting it all in himself I'm like okay so that's my that's my, I guess my one phone story <laughs> that's a great answer um, all right so we have two questions left the first one is what are the big picture hopes for grassroots baseball you know still so new this just started only a couple of years ago as you both think a couple of years down the line five ten twenty years down the road maybe if it extends out past yourselves what would you like to see with grassroots baseball uh jeff i'll start with you well the the program was really gene's vision to begin with so i, I you know i would you want to start gene no we no you, we both have the vision though i mean i, I okay. started it's not, yeah, I mean. Yeah, Jeff no, I, I, you know, I just think the success we've had so far, what the feeling it's provided for and seeing how kids react, I think as long as I, I'd like to see us continue to be able to make an impact with kids who don't have that opportunity, don't know that there's the opportunity. And, you know, uh, life is all about opportunity. And uh, uh, you see that over and over and hear that over and over again from celebrities and, and athletes and role models that, Without an opportunity, they never would have gotten to where they wanted to. And if we can continue to provide opportunity, then I think that we're doing our job well. Gene, what about you? What's what's the vision in your head as you see forward? Uh, for us, I mean, we're growing the program, and now uh, with COVID starting to get behind us, we I mean, we've actually made a lot of progress. You know, during COVID, getting ourselves together, becoming an official not for profit. Um, we did a tremendous work, amount of work on the second book. Um, but we have a program uh, that we're getting ready to launch in Puerto Rico. So we'll be able to do clinics uh, across Puerto Rico as a next venture. So it's fun to be able to do, you know, continue to do things on Route 66 and, you know, now also work in Puerto Rico and being able to jump back and forth between the U.S. and possibly some international um, destinations and growing it and, we will grow and we'll get bigger and we'll have more people helping us. And, and that's already happening with sponsors and that's terrific, but also setting an example uh, for others. So, you know, you just hope more people do the same. And when I tell the story of why I get so excited about shooting grassroots baseball, I know I'm also inspiring other photographers that it's not just about shooting the major league game. You don't need to shoot the most famous person. Sure. Clayton Kershaw is fun to photograph, but you can be more creative and you can tell a terrific story at any level and, and, and tell the story of the grassroots game. And so people, when you show the importance of grassroots, they get it and then they pass that on. When you're at a little league organization, they also rise a little bit more. You know, they see a volunteer and that brings another volunteer. So you're showing by example, and that's how you grow. You grow in a grassroots way. Sorry for the, but that's that's what we're doing. And, uh, you know, so many people I see, like they'll send me something, they send me images all the time and like thinking about you, grassroots, you know, and they send me their grassroots images. And it's really fun to get those people sharing and understanding the message. And 
Um, and we have people saying, what can I do? So when we have people reaching out to us saying, what can I do? And they reach out to Jeff plenty, you know, and offering donations, offering equipment, offering their help to join in. And um, that's just terrific. So I feel really hopeful for the future of grassroots when you have people reaching out proactively and saying, how do I get involved? So um, I think we're, we're on our way. That's really exciting. Um, all right, we gotta we gotta finish up for both of your schedules. You've given us a lot of time. Let me ask you a final question. We ask absolutely everybody, what does baseball mean to you? It's a tough one. I'm gonna go with you first, Jeff. What does baseball mean to you? Everything. It's a good answer. <laughs> um, and, and no, it's so, yeah. It's, go ahead, it's, expound on it. No, it's an important part of our fabric. As uh, uh, you know, all of us. There's so many. Life is so fast paced. When we come back out of COVID and we get back to the pace we're on, you can always step into baseball, sit down, score a game and enjoy it. And uh, I don't know, baseball just uh, is something that's near and dear to my heart. And like Gene feels with a camera, I feel with a scorebook where I could be in a major league game, you know, charting pitches of Clayton Kershaw, or I could be at a t-ball game and, and just enjoying watching those kids run around just as much. Gene, what about you? What does baseball mean to you? It, baseball for me, it means it's nostalgic. It's nostalgia. It's, it's, it is, it's, it's never been the action on the field for me though. That sure that's exhilarating, but it really just means the connection of generations and it's, it brings families together. It truly is America's pastime. I don't want to sound so sappy with this answer, but I, I that's what I see, you know, on every level, you know, I see the connecting of generations. I got to see it at the ballpark yesterday. I was shooting uh, the Dodgers with Oakland A's and seeing fans for the first time. And I, you know, just turned around and I love seeing the families and just seeing the dad telling the story, taking the phone away from the kid, getting him to pay attention to the game. And it's, it's connecting generations. And that's what baseball does in this wonderful nostalgic way. It brings us back to a different time when things moved a little bit slower um, and we're still catching it, still keeping up with it today and, and keeping it alive. And um, I think it uh, it provides, you know, such a such an opportunity to, you know, life is complicated now with COVID and everything else and, and that's going on in the world. So if, you know, you can have that in your life to slow things down and help connect, you know, a father, son, a mother, daughter, a mother, son, whatever it is and, and keep it alive and bring the generations together. It's a, uh, it's an, it's a, uh, it's America's pastime. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing. Um, Jeff Idelson and Gene Bruce, uh, the first book is available. People can go out and get it. Please do. It's a great gift. Uh, it's a great thing for yourselves. I got a couple of them for friends. You still have a couple left over signed by hall of famers, not that much more expensive than the book itself. And I think you did something with Sean last year or two years ago at Foley's uh, with Ump's Care. So that's the first book right there. Check it out on, on your website. Um, anything you want to tell anybody about uh, the next book or anything Grassroots is doing, now's a good time. You can follow. There's Yeah, Grassroots Baseball. Uh, follow and check it out on the website. Jeff, anything you want people to know about the organization that you're up to? We are just continuing... We're just continuing to crank along. We, uh, we head out to Chicago next week and then Baxter Springs, Kansas, Gene, for opening day in that little beautiful, cool little tiny town with the, of Little League there. And Yeah, um, follow along, you know, and, uh, you know, please reach out if you, if, you, if you feel so inclined. But if you just follow us at Grassroots Baseball, you know, whatever your social media preference is, Facebook or Instagram or, you know, join, you know, join us on our website, um, uh, we'd love to hear from you or just follow along in the journey. Amazing. So Jeff Idelson, Jean Fruth, I just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this, for taking the time out of your busy schedules and working through it. Um, this was a real good pleasure. I want to put in a plug for mascots at some point. Got to get mascots in on the action, I think. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's a few mascots in the book. I, I I'm a big fan of mascots. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm I'm with you. So uh, yeah, we have to, we have to add a few more. I agree. I'm thinking um, thinking of I'm thinking of getting a sod poodle for my house. The sod poodle seems to be the one to go with. <laughs> so 
I do want to thank you both. I appreciate you doing this and we will keep in touch and we'll keep up with what you're doing. Thank you so much. Have a really great night. Uh, thanks for your time. Yeah. Bye. Bye. -bye.